Welcome to the Real Estate Power Play Podcast, your launch pad for skyrocketing success in real estate investing. I'm your host, Gabe Rodarte, alongside Mark Monroe. We're ready to bring you transformative stories, groundbreaking strategies, and the insider secrets of real estate giants. Get ready to accelerate your investment journey and become a true power player in the world of real estate. Okay, welcome to Real Estate Power Play. Hopefully this thing is recording okay. And this is our second take. I feel we actually did this last week and the quality came out horrible. I don't know why um, over in Zoom, the quality of the whole broadcast and everything, it was all corrupt and everything came out bad. So Nathan, I apologize. Thank you for coming back again. But I definitely want to get you on here because, you know, we have a lot to go over and you got your big event coming up, but we'll go through that here in a little bit. But uh, I know last time we talked, we talked about your weekend. How was this past weekend? <laughs> Let's see. This past weekend, what did we do? We, uh, oh, I know. My my son and I went up to go snowboarding. We've got season passes up at their ski club here. <laughs> we got one run in. One. We, we went up, and it was a beautiful day. It was really a shame because it was such a nice day, and it was warm, and the snow was nice and grippy, like no ice or anything. And uh, as we came down to like there's there's a lower chair and then an upper chair and by the time we got down to that upper chair again it was stopped and it was because it's it was a windy day so it, it didn't i didn't think it was that windy but i guess it was windy enough but yeah. all the chairs had been shut down so we went oh shoot so we decided rather than chance it and get stuck on a chair somewhere we'd rather just go home that happened to me. Yeah, yeah. So that happened to me a few years ago. I was skiing uh, Lake Tahoe, the Heavenly uh, Resort, and they okay. had the Nevada side and the California side. And yeah. the one that to cross over, the chairlift was shut down, so everybody was getting stuck on one side, and they had to take buses all the way back around to the other side. Uh, luckily, oh, wow. I, I lucky they were mentioning that they're shutting it down when we we're at the top, so we kind of lucky we went over back towards the uh, other side. That we we're staying in the California side, so we got real lucky oh, on that. But it's crazy how it can just shut down like that. The wind, like it's amazing. Yeah, and and it was. I mean, it was windy, but I didn't think it was that bad. But apparently, I guess so. But all the chairs were set, shut down. We even even the bunny hill. We thought, well, we'll just do the bunny hill a few times just to wait it out. And even that was shut down. So we're like, nah, forget it. We're going home. Oh, so let's just dive in. Let's, uh, you know, we we uh, you know we've known each other for a while now. Um, I went yeah. to your last um, event in Nashville. Um, I actually spoke at that event, so thank you very much for having me on. I actually had a great time. Met some fabulous people there. Um, why don't you plug it real quick, and then we're going to ask questions, and you can kind of plug it again. So you have your event coming up again in uh, this, what is it, end of June? No, end of May, early June. Why don't you go ahead, and I'll let you talk. Sure, yeah. So it's May 31st, June 1st in Nashville, Tennessee. It's called the Diversified Mortgage Expo, and it is just – it's the place to be if you're looking to – do anything with notes. If you're creating notes, if you're buying notes, if you're brand new and you don't know anything about it. Uh, we actually, it was interesting last year at the beginning, we kind of did sort of an informal survey to see who's brand new and who's been doing this a long time. And I was surprised at how evenly split it was. I thought that we'd have more, more newbies, but it was actually very evenly split. So, which means you've got the brand new people that had never even heard of it. They just barely heard of this and thought they'd come and check it out. And the guys that had, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, 100 note portfolios that had been doing this for years and years and years. So that whole gambit was there and, and it was a great place to come together, meet each other. I'm really hoping that people that are doing creative finance come because this is a fantastic place for you to come, learn how to create your notes so that if you want to sell them sometime in the future, you've got a network of people that are ready to do that. Yeah, the, I mean, the quality of the people that I met there were unbelievable. The networking was just at another level. It was great. Great group of people. Everybody flew in from all over the country. And, uh, yeah. you know, Nashville, the food. <laughs> the food, the atmosphere, the everything. Like on the, the Friday night, people like to go out and have fun and whatever. And downtown Nashville, if you've never been there, I mean, it's a blast. I'm not, I'm not much of a party guy, but it's a blast. There's so much fun. Uh, just hanging around. And then that's, that's the beauty. You go out with people that you just met that day 
Uh, and you start to build those relationships and you start to kind of put together what can we do together in business and how can we make this work? And it's, it's just a magic formula that works really well. No, I thought it was great. Um, definitely. Um, you know, I really truly appreciate it. Whoops. Somebody was just sending me a call at the same time. So I hate that I'm on here and I'm like, I want all the programs shut down and people are sending me messages all at the same time. You ever notice that's how it always happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Nathan, how, you know, we talked briefly last time, how did you get started in the note game? Why don't you kind of give a little brief background on yourself on how it all started? Yeah, for sure. So I, um, going back a little ways. So I did some fix and flip. I ended up being a landlord for a little bit back in like 05, 06, 07. And then just as everything was starting to go haywire, uh, I was kind of introduced into this world and and kind of ish. So a friend of mine had networked into a group of investors who had bought a portfolio of properties, mostly centered in the Midwest, Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana, where they had bought this portfolio April of 2007. So like height of the market. And they had intended to just flip this this portfolio out to somebody else. That deal fell through. By the time I came into the scene on in the fall of 2008, everything was just going nuts. And uh, they knew they were in trouble. So they basically just kind of gave us carte blanche and said, whatever you can do, just you know, try to help us get out of this pickle. We know we're in trouble here. So do whatever you can do. So we kind of thought we'd invented seller financing. Uh, a couple of Canadian boys. It's really not done in Canada. So we thought we'd kind of come up with this brilliant idea of selling houses on terms and uh, and creating these. We didn't even call them notes. We called them contracts. We didn't even know, we didn't even know there was a name for that. Uh, but then as we kind of got into it, I went to my first note conference in 2009 uh, down in Louisiana, which was awesome. And it just it blew my mind just to see how many people were out here that knew what I was talking about when I was talking about. The seller, I, I learned it was called seller financing. I learned they were called notes. I, you know, I learned all this stuff and I, I learned that there was a whole community out there doing it. So that's, that's kind of how I got started. Started buying non-performing. Uh, we were buying non-performing notes to get the property. And then we would use creative financing to sell the houses on the back end and then sell the notes. So it was, it's, it's just kind of morphed over the years. These days, personally, I, I've got my mortgage, I've got my fund where we buy performing mortgages. Uh, and then that's a, that's a big piece of what we're doing now. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I, I did my first note by accident at the age of 19. I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. It worked out great. I loved it. I should have, I should have started a little bit sooner in it, but yeah, you would just, you stump, I, we all kind of stumbled into the note world by accident. Um, yeah. when I was 19, but then I got into real estate banking at the age of 25. And then I really got into the notes, you know, with, uh, you know, my lending business. So do you remember how many um, notes that you created out of a portfolio back then? Um, not a ton. We were able to sell some of them just for cash, uh, just for any kind of cash flow for ourselves. And then, uh, and then we were able to do seller financing, probably a dozen of them out of the 60. Uh, some of them we'd found that the houses had already been demolished. Like they're, they're rough houses in rough neighborhoods. Um but probably a dozen or so where we did the seller financing and, and that's where it kind of clicked. So we went from that and then started doing a, a project based right in Columbus, Ohio. Just, we thought, okay, the concept works, but let's figure out how to do it more efficiently. So we went down just to Columbus, Ohio, buying those non-performing notes, get the property and then sell it back on terms. And that worked for a couple of years. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Nice. No, I, I, uh, did you, no, you said this was in 2009. Yeah. So first note conference, 2009, we started doing those seller finance, uh, properties like 2009, 10, uh, winding it down by the end of 2010. And that's when I started buying the non-performing and then with the non-performing man, it can go all kinds of different directions. So seller financing, having that, that little bit of experience under my belt was extremely helpful just to know, one more strategy of something else we could were, do. Were the notes that you purchased, any of them becoming non-performing? Is that how you kind of got into the non-performing? No, they were already non-performing. Oh. So I had learned about that. I had taken a class like 20, 2009, 2010, somewhere in there. And they, they kind of talked about it as, as a different strategy, but it wasn't something that a lot of people were pursuing at the time. And then I was presented with an opportunity to buy three non-performing notes all in Columbus, Ohio, for a total of ten thousand dollars. 
I'm like, well, that sounds like a $10,000 experiment I'm willing to, to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so we did that and it worked incredibly well. We did very well on those ones. And so I was hooked after that. that what was the, uh, the, vi the face value in those notes that you purchased at 10,000? What were they? Well, I know the market was uh -huh. shifting a little bit, but a ballpark. Yes. Very shifty market at the time. So property values were probably between 20 and $30,000 each, uh, which I figured that there's no way I can lose money on these. So it was like and 10 then, cents and a uh, dollar in a sense, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And then th that was the other interesting thing is back then the, the balance on the note was probably like 60, 70,000. So just because of the time and that's just kind of how it went. But, uh, so no, what'd you end up doing with those notes? Did you take the properties back or did you work something out with them? Like what, what was the, yeah. the exit strategy on those? So on two of them, uh, it ended up working out that the owners of those properties lived in another house in Columbus, Ohio. So they, they had bought these properties as rental properties, income properties that they thought was a good idea at the time and probably was. So I was able to locate two of the borrower or two of the owners were still in Columbus. I was able to just knock on the door and say, Hey, I'm not here to collect any money. I just want the property. Are you willing to just sign it over for, to me in exchange for wiping out your loan? And they're like, absolutely. You know, two for two. They're like, are you kidding me? Yes, of course. So I signed over the property and that's how I acquired. That's how I went from owning the note to owning the property. And then on the third one, the other kind of aha moment that I had was, so this, the owner of the property lived in Arizona, like way far away, uh, totally removed from the property. And on that one, we knew this before we went in, but uh, it was a property that was not too far from Columbus, or sorry, from uh, Ohio State University. And uh, so the idea was it had had a fire. We were going to just demolish it and then rebuild it as student housing. And the more we went into it, the more it just, you know, it was hard to get that money together. And it's a big project to do that kind of thing. And I'm in Canada. My partner's in California. And the biggest thing was there was a $10,000 tax lien on the property. And the big like light bulb moment for me was it's not my house. So I'm not actually directly responsible for those taxes. So I can just let it go. I can just do nothing. I've already made my money on those other two and there's no repercussions. There's no problem with just letting it go. So that was like, Oh, wow. So that's actually not mine to pay. <laughs> I can, if I want, and I could use it to, you know, save the house and go on with my plan, but the rest of the plan wasn't coming together and I'd already made my money. So, nah. So we just let it go back to the county. So you lost out, you, you didn't get anything on that one then? You just let it go? Yeah, not on that. We sold okay. one of them for cash for 20,000. So I already doubled my money. And then nice. the other one, we ended, ended up renting it out for uh, five or $600 a month. And we held on to that for uh, about a year before we sold that. So nice. we did That's great. really well. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. Do, you, do you have any other options like, uh, so yeah, you can just let it go. So you had no, no, and you probably got the write off too, because that, whatever that face value note yeah. is on top of it. Yeah, exactly. Excuse me. Whoops. Sorry about that. So that even helps yes. you out. Cause you got the, you got the write off, you know, I, um, you know, I had a friend recently, um, he has a business. Um, it's a, and what they do is they like to build the, the ground up in this business. And, um, I don't want to kind of get into it because I don't want people kind of knowing who, who he is or anything. Because if I say it, what he does, then they may know. But anyways, what happened was he had a business. His model was he took a loan out for $17 million in Ohio. Um, yeah. And uh, he developed the business. And then after the business is up and running, he sells the business off and he holds the real estate. Well, what happened was they took a loan out for $17 million, They paid down $14 million, And guess what? COVID hit. So it really, yeah. and they took the loan out from a small community bank up there. And then what happened was um, they, the bank wanted it off the books so bad because I guess they needed the write off. And at the time, you know, for every bad dollar, you had to have a, a few dollars set aside. They ended up buying the note from the bank. Now, granted, they owed 14 million. They bought the note from the bank for $4 million. Wow. Think about that one. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's incredible. Wow. There's so many opportunities with notes. It's it's a great, great. And, and the bank, the bank got the write off. You know, yeah. you know. So. Yeah, so it's they're not 
sad necessarily. You know what I mean? Like they're okay with that. They needed that write off anyway. So that's okay. Nice. Win win. So I, I know, uh, you know, we connected because I do a lot of seller financing um, and I originate. I usually hold most of my stuff. I usually don't sell them, but it is amazing. Another strategy because, you know, I create the notes, but I guess I haven't really started buying notes yet. And I, re- I probably should. I had a good friend of mine um, over the past year uh, buying. He's purchased over 200 land notes, maybe okay. a little bit more um, over a year. And now he's cash flowing about $45,000 a month off these land notes. Isn't that crazy? That's amazing. Of yeah, land notes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And that's, that's my plan is that's my retirement is buy a portfolio of notes, live off of it. That's it. Yeah. And then no, as one doing... pays off, I replace it. I know. I was shocked. I was like, whoa, you know? Yeah. You, you, yeah. So he just, he lives off of some and he keeps returning, putting some back in because eventually those notes will come, you know, they'd be paid off at some point or come, you know, completely or, or refinance or whatever you want to call it or sold. Um, so you yeah. constantly have to keep reinvest, um, you know, putting the capital back in the notes. So I think it's a great idea and it's, yeah. you know, and, you know, think about it, your car, you know, if you get a flat tire, or your battery dies, does the car lender care about if, you know, they want their money compared to a landlord, you have to go out there and you got to change the tire, you got to change the car. So there's definitely right. a difference, um, just carrying the notes and the paper. That's what I like. I love creating that arbitrage. Yeah, it's the way to go. And then, you know, and then you can go all kinds of directions with it. Like. For example, what if you can do all that in an IRA? Or what if you don't even buy the note, you give your note to somebody like me with a fund, completely passive, you don't have to do anything about it. It just comes in and then that you're building that income in your IRA or your Roth IRA or your 401k and growing that all tax-free. Right. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Because I understand it, but I think a lot of users, when you say that in their 401k, their head might spin a little bit. Like, huh, huh? how does that work? Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah. It's, and you know, I get extra excited about it because it's not available to me. I'm a Canadian citizen, so I don't get to use IRAs. We've got our Canadian equivalent, but honestly, it's not as good in some ways, some ways it's actually better, but anyway, we won't get into that. But, uh, but IRAs are a fantastic vehicle and there are several. And in fact, we're going to have a couple of different IRA companies at the conference uh, coming up uh, at Diversified Mortgage Expo. But they and they are the experts, so they can fill in the blanks. But uh, basically, you can set up an IRA that's self-directed, meaning you can choose where those funds go. So you can choose to put it into notes yourself. You can choose to put that into all kinds of different things, uh, and then build that income in your retirement account tax-free. So literally, you can go, you know, say you've got a hundred thousand dollars in there, put it into whatever investment you'd like. I think notes is a great one. And a note fund is even better, but put it in there, let it sit and let it just accumulate. And you don't have to do anything about it. And then that's all tax-free money. And then you can take that out when it's uh, time for retirement. It's that's a great. great, great way to build your yep. retirement. So the c- people, the companies that you have in there, they're called what custodians. And they're the ones that are the, th- the middle party between your IRA or 401k, you know, so it has to be do all the legal proper paperwork and then, uh, pass it on into whatever fund or whatever note that they're investing or whatever that they're looking to do for their investment vehicle. Yeah. And you can, like I say, you can use an IRA, you can use a, a 401k from an old employer. You can use that to self-direct and put that wherever you'd like. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic vehicle. So let's talk a little bit um, towards the people that are in the seller financing world where I work with a lot of these people and, you know, you're in the, the group, uh, you're out there very active um, in the seller financing home group. I think we're up to almost 110,000 members in there now. Um, and I would definitely going to post this in there so that people can, so those people that are fairly new doing seller financing um, or creative deals, if you will, um, mm-hmm. because a lot of times they know seller financing, but we also have the other strategies, you know, we have the, the lease options, you know, some, the lease options and also the agreement for deeds and land contracts or whatever you want to call them. You also do those, uh, as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. So when I first got started, when I was creating those notes, it was in Ohio. So in Ohio, it's called a land contract. Absolutely. I was all over that. So we were selling these houses on land contract, collecting the payments, the cool thing is the borrower is the one that takes care of the property, which is fantastic. If you've been a landlord, you know how much fun it's not <laughs> where you're having to, at the very least, you have to set aside a portion of the rent every month for 
eventual repairs that you're going to have to do at some point. Uh, and it's just, and I can tell you from experience, yes, those, those repairs come up and they come up probably more often than you would like. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's just more, more work, more hassle to deal with. Now on the downside, you don't get the appreciation. Well, on the land contract, yes, you do because you still own the property. Uh, but now, who you know, gets the depreciation? You as the note holder or the buyer? Who's the one that's getting the depreciation? So my understanding is um, the appreciation or the depreciation? Either or. Why don't you talk about both? Well, the depreciation because the, the, the end buyer, I'm assuming because based off the contract, you're locking into a price, they're getting appreciation. But who's the one that's getting the depreciation on it? That's you. That's you, the homeowner. You get to to write that off. So, I mean, that's... That's a win-win. I'm, I'm a big fan. And you know, it's interesting. So, you know, Dave, uh, pretty well. Uh, yeah. I'm a big fan of land contracts, contracts for deed, agreement for deed, bond for deed, agreement, you know, whatever. It's got all kinds of different names. I'm a big fan. Dave's not. He actually doesn't like those uh, for different reasons. But, uh, but I think because that's what I started with, I'm really comfortable with those. I, I'm happy to look at those and buy those if the numbers work. And typically, if something goes bad on those, you do you go through the whole legal process, or you just try to work something out with them and try to like cash for keys type of situation? Yeah, you know, as a note investor, I want notes. I don't necessarily want properties, so I would rather work something out with the borrower if there's something to work out. If there's not, and that happens, that's fine. Then we'll look at a cash for keys, a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Uh, and see if there's something else we can work out. Foreclosures are our last option. That being said, it's a viable option and it's one that can be exercised and it's very effective. Uh, but I don't want to own property if I can help it. So I would rather just own the note and I'll, I'll do what I can to keep it that way. So wh what do you give them, like a three strike rule? Like, all right, you put them on a payment plan, get them back to normal type of situation, or is it a case by case? It's really case by case. And we'll talk together and figure out okay, what's the problem? And then see what we can do about that to, to address the problem itself rather than just, you know, it can be easy to say, okay, well, let's just lower your monthly payment. Is that really going to work? Is that going to make any difference? Does that help you as the, as the owner of that, uh, that land contract or contract for deed? Is that actually viable for you? So it's, it's really a case by case. And I've done all kinds of things. We've done it where we've actually raised the interest rate, where we've raised the payment, where we've, you know, shortened the, the amortization, where we've lengthened it, where, you know, everything you can think of. And we've done all kinds of things, whatever works for that situation. Nice. That totally makes sense. Um, yeah, I like that a lot because you have to. I mean, you know, like you said, foreclosure is the last result, but we all been there. We go through it. You know, it's mm -hmm. we'd rather deal because uh, it, it doesn't end well for anybody. It doesn't w end well for them and it doesn't end well for you. I mean, it's, you can get the property back, yes, or you get the note back or you can resell it. Um, but yeah, it's just, but in some cases, you know, you're looking to buy those to try to take that because you can buy it at a discount um, when somebody's in that. And then you, and what do you do? You normally go in and just kind of work something out with a previous person. Like say if I have a piece of property and, you know, they haven't paid me in eight months and I'm like, Nathan, here you go. Buy, take this note off my hands. You know, tell me a little bit, like, what what's your strategy, what you think uh, you would do on something like that? You know, and, and it's funny because in a situation like that, um, it, it happens pretty often where they didn't make payments to you and, and you guys have had some kind of a relationship in the past. And for whatever reason, yeah, it, it's it's just become difficult. I then come in as as the new person that doesn't know anything about the situation and I can go in and say, okay, so what is the issue? How can we res resolve it? And because there's no bad blood there, uh, it, it's much easier. And I've seen that time and time again, where it's so much easier for me as a third party to come in and say, okay, well, I know I understand that Mark guy. He, yeah, he's he's seriously a jerk. Yeah, I was like, no, I I agree. Yeah. <laughs> we can we can you know, not, go through. You know, it's 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 funny you say that. I actually had one like that. <laughs> They, yeah. I, I tried everything and they just did not like me. And then it got to a point where I was like, you know, it was just like, and I did, I'm like, here, take this deal. I lost like 25. I actually lost more than that on that one. Um, and then the next person came in, worked out a whole thing, gave him some cash for keys and just, it worked out well where I should have done it in the beginning, but I listened to my attorney. Keep that in mind. Be careful. Listen to your attorneys. <laughs> yeah.
they're they're useful and they're they're needed, but uh, they don't sure. necessarily have all the answers. Yeah, so. wait 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 till your attorney if you can't resolve it to allow us try to work it out with them first because the attorneys just make things especially with their attorney and your attorney to get together. It, that's where it gets really bad, and that's where they're always like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then as, and then as a third party, I come in and all of a sudden I'm the hero because, you know, I just don't know anything about the situation. I can come in totally fresh and totally clean and we can make something work. I don't know if I told you my, my first note deal at 19. Did I ever tell you how I did that note? I don't think so. No, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. I was 19 years old, uh, in the small little town of Vermont and, uh, I bought the old Carlton sheets course back in the day, you know? Yeah. And uh, he's like, oh, put signs up. Uh, we buy houses. So I put these signs up on the on the uh, we buy houses uh, on the telephone pole. Well, I didn't know I couldn't put stuff on the telephone pole. I got yelled at by the municipality. So but during that time period, before I took it down, this guy called me up and goes, hey, I got this mobile home for sale. It's uh, worth twenty one thousand dollars. Give me eighteen thousand for it. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't want a mobile home. You know, I have no clue what I'm doing, by the way. And then he calls me back like a week later. Give me fifteen thousand dollars. It's worth twenty one thousand. I'm like, I'm not interested. Another week or two goes by. He calls me up because give me twelve thousand dollars for this mobile home. It's worth twenty one. I'm thinking, OK, do you own the land? No, I don't. It's in a mobile home park. I'm like, I'm not interested. So about a month goes by. Calls me again. Give me six thousand dollars for this mobile home. It's worth twenty one thousand. Now I'm thinking about yeah. back of my mind. Okay, this is a deal, but I kept saying I'm not interested. No, no, thank you. But this is what I'll do. I'll give you three thousand dollars to help you out um, because I found out he has lot rent and he he wasn't living there and he just didn't have the money. I'm like, I'll give you three thousand dollars. He goes, go on, give me four. I'm like, I'm not interested. He goes, okay, I'll do it for three thousand. So all right, I have to go get a contract. I got to send somebody out to inspect the property. So what I did is I hung up, put an ad in the newspaper. Uh, Owner uh, mobile home for sale for twenty five thousand dollars. Owner financing with three thousand dollars down. Put that ad up. Went and got the contract. While I was doing that. The ad went. Um, the first person that called me, the lady, her and her boyfriend and her, and her child, they went out there looked at it. They wanted it immediately. So I took the three thousand dollars from them, gave it to the seller, created a note like around like seven and three quarters over seven years. I was 19 years old and it, it ended up being my car payment insurance payment over like seven years. I had no clue what I was doing. I'm sure the paperwork was screwed up because it was like a motor vehicle. So that was my first creative deal. <laughs> I had no clue what I was doing. Yeah, no. And, and I mean, in that case, like your return is infinite. Like you got no money in the deal. That's fantastic. That's amazing. I little, I think I, I had to pay like $150 for transfer because it was like a motor vehicle at that time. I didn't know anything about it because it was, it wasn't, but it still worked. You know, that's how, you know, a trailer or a mobile home was considered a motor vehicle. And this was up in Vermont. So it worked out well. And, and then I went, uh, got into school and then the corporate world. And then I got back in at the age of 25. And then at, you know, uh, a year or two later, that's when I started, really started doing the investing and getting back into it. So I wish I stayed in it earlier when I was 19. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's all it, life experience. Any kind of experience is good experience. So that's good. So, um, the, your event coming up in Nashville, what yes. type of, what kind of speakers do you have? What, what kind of things that you have going on at this particular event? We have, let me look at the schedule over here. Cause we've got all kinds of really cool stuff happening. We've got panels on, Oh, this is cool. So we've got somebody coming from the Mortgage Bankers Association. Um, they're going to talk to us about like what's the state of the market, what do they see coming down the pipe. They've been very accurate on their predictions so far. So I'm I'm always interested to hear what they have to say. Uh, we've got man attorneys talking about different ways to look at at paperwork and if you're buying a note, what's important, what's not, kind of thing. We've got different breakout sessions where we're going to actually look at one of the sessions they're going to actually look at a, a tape so like a list of loans for sale and go through with everybody there in an interactive interactive session saying okay this is what we like about this note this is what we don't like about this note and go through with everybody there live so you can see what matters what doesn't matter how to That's break cool. it down how to look at numbers cool stuff like that we've got uh, people talking about different approaches that they use going into notes we've got oh we've got a guy that i'm using right now all about uh, capital raising and how to use social media to do that effectively and that's day one besides networking awesome. besides 
you know, different activities we've got going on. So that's everybody, that's everybody's, a, everybody's going to so, be involved in that. And we're always out there trying to come up with different ideas and different ways of raising capital. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I've got you scheduled for day two in the morning. So hope, hopefully that's all right with you. <laughs> yeah, I'll be uh, definitely looking forward to it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's great. And, yeah. you know, back up to the bankers, uh, the Real Estate Bank Association, what they said last year, dead on about yeah. what they're seeing. So this was in June and they're saying what we see is coming in the fall, September, October, about the commercial world. Boom, they're right, they're right on what was happening and we're seeing it now. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're going to do the same kind of thing. They're going to talk about residential and commercial and talk about what's coming down the pipe, what they see happening. And like we said, this last time they were bang on. Yeah, this can be interesting. I that I think the government's going to have to step in, you know, in the commercial arena. It was just trillions and trillions of dollars coming due in the commercial. It's just it's going to be an, it's going to be a bloodbath. So I don't know. I got to figure out how we could play that. How can we get some of that exactly. uh, government money? <laughs> exactly. And then what's the what's the overall fallout? So the commercial world obviously is going to suffer, but then what else that will be attached to that? Like what's the, kind of the collateral damage attached to that? That'll be interesting to see. True. I do see that uh, the administration threw what forty three, is it forty three billion, that they're throwing it into uh, converting um, uh, commercial office buildings into multifamily. I know a few of them are being done in Chicago. They're trying to do, but it's an alternative. But it's it's hard. The plumbing situation in those commercial buildings are hard to turn it into uh, multifamily. Yeah, plumbing for sure. That's going to be the biggest challenge. And then, and then electric to a lesser extent, but I mean, that's a huge renovation. Like that's, that's a lot. Of work. It, it, if you didn't have the government helping you, it just wouldn't make, it wouldn't be cost effective. It just wouldn't work. Right. So, yeah. so that's Nathan, what, what, one more time, one of the dates of this particular, uh, one's the uh, convention, uh, what, the expo, what do you call it, the expo or convention? Uh, the conference expo convention, conference. whatever. All of the kind of above. So it's, it's a whole yeah. gathering of uh, note buyers. I love it. And sellers. Gathering, yeah. And sellers, yes. So it's May 31st, June 1st in Nashville, Tennessee. And you can go check out all the information and tickets and everything on uh, diversifiedmortgageexpo.com. Repeat That's it one more time. Be. Where was it? Diversifiedmortgageexpo.com. And how, if somebody, because I know you guys do a podcast as well, why don't you, uh, where can they find you there as well? Yeah, so Dave Putz and I do a podcast every other week on Fridays. Uh, we've got one coming up, I believe, this Friday, actually. Uh, so it's depending on when this airs. But anyway, <laughs> this Friday or next Friday. Uh, but it's JKP Holdings. And you can just find that on Facebook. Uh, and the event is there. It's it, That's Dave's company. And then he's got a YouTube channel. And we, we're on different podcast places or um it's called the Apple one and wherever we're all over the place, but that's, that's what to look up JKP holdings. And are you and David doing like education training people as well? Uh, to a lesser extent. Yes, we do okay. some training. Um, one thing that we do actually from time to time is we do kind of a, an intermediate training. So if you've gone and you've done your intro course and, uh, and then you're like, okay, now what? Uh, Cause those intro courses, it's just an intro. Uh, but then we do kind of a little bit more advanced training that'll get you more comfortable with how it works. We go through, we've got two whole classes all about building a bid calculator so that as you're looking at different deals, you can plug in the numbers and say, okay, so because of this, this, and this, that makes it a good deal. This and this are good, but that one's not good. So that, that kicks it out and you can go through and evaluate very quickly. That's awesome. So Nathan, thank you so much for uh, coming back a week later. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. this quality yeah, comes fun. out much better. So Yes. Uh, we'll see it. So thanks so much. Uh, thank you guys for listening to real estate power play. If you guys have any questions, you'll be able to click on the link below. Um, you should, we'll have Nathan's information on there as well. And let's see you guys in Nashville. All right. Take care. Be well. Take care, right, Nathan. Thank you. Yep. You bet. Bye-bye.